This is all I want That the love I have for you Doesn't fade along with youth Can you help with that? The reason that I ask Is I've seen far too many friends Walk away and not come back I want more than that Wash away like branches in rain. I'd rather be kindling in the fire. So set me on fire like I've never known. I want to love you more as life goes on. And all of my days, I'll place my. is all I pray over everything I ask that my friends one day come back can you help with that But you wait at the base And pull us like driftwood from the wild So set me on fire like I've never known I want to love you more as life goes on So all of my days I'll place my first love first Drifting, but you called me home, so I'll 
Oh, 
guys. Um, I wrote it when I was in like sixth grade, and whenever I sing this song, it just always comes back. It always comes back. So here we go. <laughs> You paid a price You died for me You gave your life And you set me free You paid a price You died for me sing this song, God just reminds me of a revelation I had a couple years ago about how not only does God love you, but he likes you so much. He likes who you are. He likes who he made you to be. And there's nothing you can do that makes you like you any less. Like, he loves you. And he like. And then I started thinking, God, not only do I love you, but I guess I like you too. You're kind of cool. You're kind of cool guy. I remember <laughs> I when like she you. had that revelation. <laughs> she came up and she said, did you know that God not only loves me, but he likes me? It was like the light went on. It was just, and I made me want to giggle, but it made my heart feel warm too. Yeah, God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Brother Terry, I'm going to take care of your job, okay? They good? You guys are great. I appreciate it very much. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you guys. Hey, man, got some pickleball friends over here. Got the Dickersons from, well, let's see, is it Richburg? South Carolina. 
Man, a church that's alive is worth the drive. It was worth it. Well, it's good to see y'all this morning. It's been a while since I've been here, and I think they're just getting even with me. But I enjoyed the first service immensely with everybody. It was great, and it's good to see you guys. Uh, before we get started, just to mention to you, my wife tells you that she loves you. She'd love to be here today, but most of you know that we're, we're in a little battle here, and we're dealing with some stuff, and she's in good spirits. She's an awesome woman. She laughs, and she praises God. And last Sunday was my 45th wedding anniversary. And that's the reason I wasn't here. I made a decision to spend every single minute of that 24 hours with her. And that's what we did. Amen. There's nobody like your wife. I don't care what anybody I could take you in the Bible. If you don't know how to treat your woman, come see me. I'll have you on it like a chicken on a bug. Hello? And if you treat her like this says, she will take such good care of you. You can't stand yourself. All you got to do is take care of your woman. Kathy, we love you, praying for you. We call you strong. The word says, let the weak say, I am strong. And so we speak life, health, and peace to you in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we've been teaching on a series on the kingdom of God. And I know that you guys are looking forward to some more stuff because I'm ready to start getting into the like-as part. And I don't have time to do a lot of recapping because what I say today if you have not been coming, might sound like an overload for a download. And so while I'm doing this, they're going to just pass the offering thing, and y'all just go ahead and get your offering ready. You know what to do. I'm not going to sit here and teach on giving forever because you're the best givers in Rockin' Hill, South Carolina. Can I get an amen? I'm serious. You, you know our church is one of the best giving churches around everybody. We, everywhere we go and anything we do, they brag on the way the shield does it. Everything. I love it. Including money. It's because money's not in charge here. Can I get an amen? What is money? It's a tool. And it's not sinful, and neither is it righteous. It only takes on the spirit of the user. Okay, that's enough of that. So we've been teaching on the kingdom, and today we're going to go to John 3.3 3 and start right there. But after not being here last week and listening and having that gap teaching on the kingdom, I want to cover some of this today on the old man and the new man as we get back into it. The thing about the kingdom, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of words. You are hearing things that are so biblical and so truth, but rarely spoken in everyday public churches around our country. Don't know why, but it's true. And so I love getting in to the deep things of God that causes my life to prosper and to have a relationship with him more intimately and closer. And doing that, you have to get your mind renewed, stay in this word, see what it says. The world will speak contrary to everything that you're reading. But God never speaks contrary to his own word. Can I get an amen? So we find in John 3, 3, Jesus answered and asked the guy. He says, verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, that word see is not involving with a natural eye because you don't see with your eyes. You see through your eyes. Actually, your mind does all the seeing. Your eyes are a gate. And when the word speaks about eyes, it's talking about understanding. It's not your eyeball. And so he's making it real clear, except a man be born again. Okay? Had a regenerative experience. He cannot see. In other words, if you have not had the experience of the new birth, the revelation knowledge of the kingdom of God is not granted to you. But if you've been born again, then the spirit of it will be granted. That's why when you teach on it, a lot of people go, huh? And a whole bunch of people come up, I've never seen that before. It's because it's not something that can really be taught. I'm serious. It has to be caught. And because what it is, the truth of it will come out and come up. You have to really grab it. And the way you do it is faith comes. Where does faith come from? Right. Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing. They're not the same words. First hearing means undivided attention. Go look it up in the Greek. Undivided attention. Faith comes by undivided attention and Hearing. Faith comes by hearing, and the other hearing means you'll get the revelation. Faith comes by undivided attention, getting the revelation, boom, faith comes. It's not just sitting around hearing yang, 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 yang. It's listening 
attending, giving your attention to it. Are you all right with me? But in the kingdom of God, he says, a man can't even see it unless he's had that experience. Now, the thing with me is our mission statement here is educating the believers part of it. And, and I'm here to tell you something. The believers have got to get educated because too many people are waiting for things to happen that's already happened. They're waiting for an experience that they've already got, and they need to understand that what they've already got, they need to be using it instead of sitting around sitting on it. So let's get there and let's go there. Are you all ready? All right. All right, in the book of Romans, let's look at the old man here in chapter 6 and verse 6. It says, knowing this, and you must know that if you're not careful, you read the Bible too fast. As a matter of fact, let me say this, say it a lot, I know it's boring to you, but believe me, it helps countless people. If you're reading your Bible from chapter to chapter, you're probably confused. Seriously. You might be one of those people that say, you know, I read it, but it's just so mysterious. And I can tell you why. It's because chapters are not in the original text. There are no chapters, there are no verses in all of the original tongue of Scripture. None. Man put chapters and verses for cross-reference and stuff, so on and so on, so you can find your place. All right? When you're reading your Bible and you read from chapter to chapter, the majority of your chapters are in the middle of a thought when the chapter ends or starts. So you close your Bible at the middle of a thought. You open it up the next day, I hope, but you begin in the middle of the thought you closed it on. Now, you've had all this time go by since the last time you looked at it. And so, if, when you look at the Scriptures, anytime it says, therefore, and, then, look for all the conjunctions. And anytime you're reading your Bible, how many times in church have we done it? When I get to the end, I'd say, watch, look at the next verse. Verse 1. See how verse 1 joined next to it? And the revelation was in verse 1 from the whole chapter. But people didn't get it because they only read that, stopped where the revelation began. And then the next time they come together, they started where the revelation was but didn't get it. They just skipped over it. I'm being honest with you. I'm just trying to help you see the simplicity of reading Scripture. and stuff. It's really not complicated. We have a lot of people help us misunderstand the Bible. And it's not complicated. Read from thought to thought. Mark your Bible in that thought and close it. When you open it up, now personally for me, I like to back up a few verses. And I like to go back and then come back. And it puts me back in sync. But you all have your own ways of studying your Bible, where you like to sit. Where you, we all have our own atmospheres that, that we create and like. And the greater atmosphere you create for the knowledge of God, the happier, the more stronger, and more effective Christian you're going to be. So you got to know this. You're an old man is crucified with Christ. Now, I'm not saying this. This is really in your Bible. I know it looks like it's on a screen, and I printed it. I promise you it's truth. Knowing this, your old man is crucified with Christ. So we can read it and walk out of here. But do you hear what he's saying? You've all been killed. You're all dead. You're a bunch of dead people. Are you hearing it? Knowing this, your old man's crucified with him that the body of sin would be destroyed. That henceforth, we should not. Hello? You ever hear people, well, I'm just no sinner. And you can say, how are you doing today? I'm doing better than I deserve. You ever heard that? I'm doing just much better than that. Well, I don't deserve it. Man. Listen, when you have a revelation of who you are in him, that's gone. That's, that's the way the old man thinks. The old man always talks like that. The revelation of God permeating in a believer, a vessel that's considered the holy place of the Most High. Do you know that you're, biblically, that your body is, your heart is New Jerusalem? Are you funny? Listen, where do you think Christ is coming from? He's coming out of Jerusalem. Who do you think it is? It's the church. He's coming out of you. The kingdom of heaven is not waiting for you to die and go there. The kingdom of heaven comes in you at the very moment you receive Christ. Knowing this, hallelujah, I've been crucified with him. That's the reason Satan can't find me. I died at 2.30 in the morning on, listen, the 11th of June of 1977. I died. 
Larry Soul's death was right there and right then. And when I stood up from that coffee table, even though my hair was down to my belt, and that house was full of pot smoke, and my old Baptist preaching daddy standing right there beside me with his arm around me praying with me. I'm going to tell you something. When I stood up, old man was dead. Dead. I left Duke Power that Friday, high as a kite, raising hell, and went and partied. I come back Monday morning, everybody wanting to buy some drugs and want to get this and want to get that, and I'm going, hey, man, I give my heart to Christ this weekend, man. They're going, whoa, souls must be on acid or something. He's freaking out. Have you heard the way souls is talking lately? Man, talking about God and stuff like that. He's freaked out. Next thing they know, they see me up on the crane. Praise God. Man, he's gone crazy. And this and that. And just a little bit later, I can't stand it. I've been born again. I'm all fired up. I'm out here with 5,000 people. They rough. They tough. They tattooed. They cuss. They stink. They all like, just like me. We are going to have some fun. So I started preaching every day. I'd get up on the crane, and I'd preach the gospel until a whistle blowed. And about 100 guys got born again every day. Every day. And they rotate construction workers so much. If I would have leaned into my old man's thinking, if I hadn't have been going to a church as soon as I got saved and teaching me this, I'd be so full of religious junk. Now, don't get, misunderstand me. The word religion means man-made. Do you know that? Christianity is not religion. It is a family. It's bought with a blood. It's not an idea. Are you here? It's bought with blood. It's a name with an inheritance. We are not a religion. Jesus went on to make it real clear. Paul wrote it. He said, pure religion is this. And then he goes into how you take care of, of widows and so forth. Uh-huh. So you want to go into religion. Uh -huh. But then get off your hiney and roll your sleeves up. I don't live in religion. I don't even like religious spirits. I don't even call myself a Christian. I don't. I don't have to go places and tell people I'm one. When I leave, they're supposed to be telling each other. That guy that just left here, he's a Christian. He's just like Jesus. I'm going to tell you, when you walk in and announce you're a Christian, my antenna goes up. Better watch him. You ever heard people say, I don't know about Christians. You know why they say that? Because the people they call calling Christians are the ones that promote themselves. I am a Christian. Go to buy some. I'm a Christian. You ought to give me a deal. If you knew how to walk in faith with God, you can keep your mouth shut and see the favor of God come on you and get a deal and him not know why he gave it to you. Are you hearing me? Man, I can tell you tons and tons of stories. You know that's right. Now, come on. And he says that you, that the body of sin would be destroyed, that henceforth you do not serve sin. And that word serve sin, good looking at it, means be a slave. Now, bottom line is, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, 24 makes it real clear. Your spirit, soul, and body. He says, I pray God your whole spirit, your soul, and your body be preserved blameless to the coming of the Lord. Okay? Spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit is in the image and the likeness and the exactness of God. Your soul is your emotion and your will. And it is soul tied to it. It is entwined. They're inseparable twins and just about. It's hard when you study spirit and soul. There's a fine line. And then body, flesh, made from the earth. You have to understand your spirit's from heaven. Your body's from the earth. That's why when your spirit's finished with it, it shakes it off. It goes back to the dust. The kingdom that's within you continues to remain. Who you are continues to remain. How you see and think and talk and everything continues to remain. Because your fleshly body hits the ground doesn't mean you quit existing. Now you're in what's called the invisible world. The world that is in the realm of the spirit. That Romans 4.17 talks about that Abraham and God both walked in so much faith. They both call things that be not. Listen, things that are not, it's just not. As though they were. Example, Abe, you're 100, your wife's 90. Uh, who wounds dead? You're past your age. But I want you to have a child. So you're going to have a son. His name's going to be Isaac. And you know, when this is all going on, make it short, his wife's in the tent. She's stirring a pot of pinto beans, and she can hear him talking. And while she's in there stirring them beans, she's hearing God and him talk. And when she heard that, she busted out laughing. She thought that was funny. They got that won't get pregnant. <laughs> uh huh. Ninety years old. How would you ladies in? Is there anybody in here over forty want to get pregnant? 
50, 60, 70, 80, 90. And so, but Abraham, he's out there going, glory, let's get it on. Sabra's going, ha, ha. And the next thing you know, they sit down and talk about it. What happens? Sabra got a good idea. I'm too old, let's don't do this. Take Hagar. And so you go into Hagar, gets permission, and then she ends up hating Hagar because it did use Hagar, but Hagar pr produced a child called what? Ishmael. What does that mean? The word Ishmael means good idea. They had a good idea. It wasn't God's idea. It was a good idea. What does the word Isaac mean? Isaac's the promised child. Isaac's the one that God told them they were going to have. I, amen? Are you listening? What does his name mean? Laughter. One of them's funny. <laughs> All right, Hagar, so she gets Ishmael. Ishmael comes in. God blesses Ishmael just because of Abraham. But lo and behold, I don't have time to get into it, but everything we're dealing with today, hello, in the east, is because of Ishmael. Hello. That's where your Muslim birth begins is with Ishmael. I'm not going to go any further. I'm into something else. But now when you go to Ishmael, you're moving into the old man. And when you move into Isaac, you're moving into a new man. And then the word teaches us in Ephesians 4 and 22, let's just go up there, that you put off concerning a former conversation the old man. Remember, I'm always telling you, kingdom of God is a kingdom of words. The word says in Ephesians 4 and 29 that you should not let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth, only that which is good for the use of edifying, that it ministers grace to the hearer. And I always ask people, when you're talking to folks, when you walk away from them, are they better off? And are they happier? I mean, they should be. When you, anybody, if nothing else, if you could just smile and say something sweet to them and get a little twinkle or smile out of them, that's good. Everybody needs a little encouragement. Everybody. There's no one that doesn't. And everybody wants to go. You ought to hear people everywhere I go, they ask me how I'm doing. I'll be honest with you, you could run over me with an army tank. And if I had enough strength to talk and say, how are you doing? I'd say, great, getting better. You say, why do you do that? It's a revelation to me. I got it from Zig Ziglar 35 years ago. And it hit me when I was studying about the power of words. You have what you say. People don't realize it. You can tell them to their face. The Bible says you will have what you say. And they'll say, I don't have anything. I don't matter what I do, it flops. <laughs> I don't even believe what you said so. <laughs> you see the intelligence of people? See how they get? You do have what you say. I can take you into James and show you right now. Your tongue is the rudder of your ship, and you are where you are right now by every word that's come out of your mouth. If you're born again, it's because of the words that come out of your mouth. Hello? I can tell you that the words out of your mouth control your whole life. You can go home and you can open your mouth and you can create an atmosphere that is beautiful even though you've been ill all day. Or you can come home ill and you can distribute it in the house and you'll see it in the whole house. I have a different idea. I've got two acres of land, a nice home. I made my mind up a long time ago. Family, friends, everybody's welcome here. But you show your butt and you get ungodly, you're out. That sounded mean, didn't it? Well, I've done it. I've had to put family members out, children. I've had to open my gate and say, go. You can call me and make an appointment and come back and visit. But you get out until you turn around and you straighten up. These two acres is all I got where I know that I know that I know. This is mine and it's full of peace. It's full of peace and happiness and joy. I love the surrounding. I love the pond. I love everything it's set up. Why? Because it's what my wife wants. And I've got everything set up just like she wants it. And that makes me so happy. And I'm not going to let people come in with an unrighteous and an ungodly lifestyle and bring curse, and bring junk, and bring an atmosphere, and my two acres of land, and mess it up, <laughs> you ain't going to get it from him. That's my place of peace. And you want some peace, come to my house. You can get it. But you bring your drama, I'll show you the back door. I'm, I'm mean, ain't I? Oh, well. You got to put off concerning former conversation, the old man. And it says it's corrupt according to deceitful lust. Go to the next verse. Y'all going to love this. This isn't me. This is Bible. Watch this. And be renewed. He's talking to you. Be renewed in the spirit. Don't forget. Now, what is spirit? As much as y'all have heard that, not one person will tell you. What is spirit? Words. Jesus said in John 6, 63, the words I speak are spirit and life. When you speak. See, animals can't talk because they don't have spirit. They have soul. 
They have an emotion. They have will. But they don't have spirit. And it's birds. You're a spirit. You can talk. God is a spirit. God is love. And love is not a feeling. Biblical love is what you do. Yes, it is. Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what I say. Another place he said, if you love me, you will keep my sayings, words. He's saying, if you love me, you'll be obedient. See, we, we, don't, we use the word love and like. We don't understand it. Or I'm being honest with you. Uh, biblically, what's this one? All right. Do you love God or do you like God? Well... If your emotions are all about him and you get goosebumps and just love him, you really, you really like him. You say, oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I love him that much. My emotions go bonkers. No, love has nothing to do with that. That's all about your feelings and your likes. All love is about obedience. That's why faith works by obedience, love, and the God kind. The God kind of obedience, the God kind of love. So we get messed up by thinking that love is based on our feelings, how I feel about it. Man, I can care so much about somebody, it's amazing. But if they need me right now and I go that way, I didn't love them. Love is what, how do I love my enemies? I thank God for the revelation because I know how to love enemies. I mean, I can, I can remember, I loaned you $25,000. You were going to give it back in one week. And you have not given it back in years. I forgive you. I do. I just forgive it. I loose it. I let it go. It's $25,000. But you know what? If you can lie to me and do that, have at it. I know what the Word says. And the Word says that if anybody has a need for me to just go ahead and release it and give it to them. And if you do me this way, forgive you. God, take care of me. I'm not going to let you make me. I'm not going to turn myself into a yin, 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 yin. Because of your action. I'm just not going to do it. So I release him, let him go. I'm free. Next thing I know, supernatural stuff starts happening. This happens, that happens. And I never saw the $25,000 come back. But Lord, you ought to see the stuff. And not only that, I got peace in my heart. And you say, oh, you're such a loving guy. And I guess if he come back and wanted to borrow $25,000 again, you just would loan it to him. No. I'm not stupid. I'm going to just tell you. If you've been some kind of thing like that, you need to forgive that person, but you ought to be smart enough until they prove yourself. Don't release that kind of responsibility on somebody who won't live up to it. But you got to understand that forgiveness is not about how you feel. You can feel hatred and forgive because it's your obedience, not your feelings. You can curse me, and this has happened. You can curse me. And I can ride down the road and see you broke down, pull over and help you. It's happened. Why did you pull over and help them? Because there was nobody around. I saw them broke down. But they cursed you. I showed them how to bless somebody after you've been cursed. You know, all I got out of it was blessing. I got so tickled. You know, you change your understanding about people as you get to know them. You know, you can misjudge somebody real quick. And I got tickled. This lady met me one time, and, and we got to talking about the Lord, and she hopped up. Oh, I'm Catholic. I said, well, half my church Catholic. What kind of church you got? And I said, well, it's actually a non-denominational church. You know, ah, one of them. So she went on. She said, I think you're a crackpot. I said, well, my wife says everybody is. And she said, you leak. And she said, you need to be filled up with the Word so you won't be empty. She said, I think what I meant. I didn't think so. Well, a couple of years go by, and some things happened, and somebody she loves got touched, and things happened, and they asked her what happened, and they said, oh, Pastor Souls, come by, and he said, who? And, they, and so later I seen her, and she says, uh, I want to apologize to you. I said, about what? She says, I've, I've always called you a crackpot, and I call you a crackpot behind your back. And I said, well, I, I told you. My wife says we all are crackpot. She said, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm apologizing to you because I really thought you was a crackpot. But I'm beginning to realize that you are no crackpot. I thought, well, 
Whether I am a crackpot or not a crackpot. Hallelujah. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm the head and not the tail. And I'm above only and never beneath. And I'm blessed going in, going out, and in the city, in the field, in the basket, and in the store. And I just can't stand it. I mean, that's the way it is. God's so good to me. He's blessed me. And he said, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And look at the next verse. He said, bam. And that you put on. They can't do it without your mind renewed. Spirit of your mind renewed. And that you put on. You got to put it on. Just like you did your clothes, you went in the closet, you picked it out. You get up every morning and make a decision. Am I going to pick out the old man or the new man? So put your new man on. That's what he says. Watch this. Which after God, it's after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So I get up in the mornings and I go to my spiritual closet and I slip on righteousness and holiness. And I button that baby up, stand there and look in the mirror. Woo! Glory to God. I'm glad I got his because you ought to see my own righteousness. It's a pretty nasty jacket, you know what I mean? But this one, this one, God gave it to me and he clothed me. And he called me a son. And I heard your daughter talking about God likes and loves. Oh, I got a good one for her in John 20. Jesus said, Father, when he was praying, for thou hast loved them. As thou hast loved me. When I read that, I said, what? God loves me just exactly like he does Jesus. That's what Jesus said. For thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And if you get God's word in you, God and his word are inseparable. His word is who he is. People keep looking for just a physical face without understanding. He is in your place. He is in you. That word, when you get your mind renewed, more God keeps coming in. More God. Wise men seek the Lord. Ignorant men say, well, I've already found him. Mm-hmm. No, you haven't. You will always be finding him. Always. Are you all right? I got to go because I know y'all getting bored. You can't stand church. So let's get going here. Let's go to Colossians 3, and let's go from 8 to 14. Let's see what this says about the old man. I wanted to get a new man. This happened this morning in the first service. I spent more time on old man. And, and it's eating my time up. He says, but now, right now, present tense, you also, you put off this. Now, listen, he's telling you to put it off. Now, if you got up this morning and you put on anger and you put on some wrath and you got malice for a belt, blasphemy on your shoes, filthy communications coming out of your mouth, hello? Now you also, he said, put off all of it. Put off all this. Put it off. Anger. Wrath, malice, blaspheming, filthy communications out of your mouth. Next verse. Lie not one to another. Somebody said, when did they start doing that? All right. Seeing that you have, what's this? Put off. You know how you put off an old man? You quit lying. The old man's a liar. The new man tells the truth. The old man's a deceiver. The new man is a believer. The old man will cheat you. The new man will treat you. Lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man. Next verse. With his deeds. And put on a new man, which is renewed in knowledge. See, it's in the understanding, the revelation. You only get, you got to catch it. It's renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now listen. It's in the knowledge of of the image of him that created. So the knowledge is all of the image of God's knowledge. So now you understand Isaiah 55 a little bit better. Matter of fact, can you do that? It's not on there, but let's just do that because I'm not going to have time to get in a new man. I might as well wear, wear out Isaiah 55 one more time because I can tell you something. Y'all need it. Look at somebody and say, you need it. It is so quiet in this Presbyterian church. All right. Listen to what he says, and I'm going to close with this. What have I got? 3.16. That's good. Y'all not mad. Verse 7, listen to what he says. Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let an unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. Watch this. And to our God, because he will abundantly pardon. God doesn't pardon. He abundantly abundantly pardons and then he says this is God talking my thoughts 
are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. The heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, who is he talking to? Is he talking to me, somebody else, or is he talking to you? Who is he talking to? He is talking to wicked people. He is not talking to the church. He made it very, very clear. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let an unrighteous man his thoughts. And God said in verse 8, talking to the unrighteous and to the wicked. He said, your thoughts and your ways, uh uh-uh, baby, they're not mine. And nine, he said, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. That's why when you start acting like God acts, people want to know what's going on with you, man, because it's higher and different. People do not understand people that can be happy every day. I know that. Because I used to be miserable. And I got born again. I was working at Duke Power. And I come in with a smile. Ever since I got saved, I've been so happy I can't stand it. I'm serious. It put joy in me. I was going to hell. I don't know about you. I'm tickled I ain't going. Well, when I found out that wasn't what it was all about, I thought that that's what it was all about, missing hell. And I found out, no. It, 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 that's just a benny. The bottom line is God created me in the likeness and image of him to fellowship with me that me and him could walk together in his likeness and image just like he is. And the world wants to pull me down and tell me I'm unrighteous, filth, and don't deserve it, can't have it, and I not even be thinking like that about God. But God's words come in here and keeps pulling me up, so I'll cleanse you. I'll make you whole. I'll heal you and strengthen you. And I'll bring you into a place of life. And people, oh, wait a minute, brother. You're, 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 too, you're just too optimistic. How do you get too optimistic? Oh, well. I think you're too pessimistic. For my thoughts are not yours. And then in verse 9, he says, The heavens is higher, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts are yours. I'm loving this. Watch this. Now we're getting to a point here. As the rain, that's water, it comes down, and the snow, it waters from heaven. It doesn't go back there. It doesn't return, but it waters the earth. Right? Now watch the like-ass principle. It makes it bring forth. It makes it bud. And it makes it give seed to the sower. It gives bread to the eater. That's the natural realm of sowing and water. Amen? Genesis 8, 22, as long as the world stands, there will be seed time and harvest, winter and summer. So I don't get into all the climate change and global stuff and all. God's already said how to be. So shall my word, watch, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. What shall his word be that goes out of his mouth? Like rain that comes down. And waters the earth. Watch this. Makes it bud. In other words, the power to reproduce is in the seed. Jesus said the word in Mark 4, the words I speak are seeds. When you get God's words in you, they're seeds. When you meditate on them, they get watered. When you water them, they get the power is within the seed itself to burst and come forth it's not within you it's in itself the word has the power within itself to come forth if you put it in you it's a seed all of the words of God are seeds the Bible says when Jesus came into Capernaum he was preaching the kingdom of God it always decrees that when he come and he preached the kingdom preachers ask me why don't I preach on sin because Jesus didn't the apostles didn't Paul didn't Oh, they nail sin, they expose sin, but they didn't preach sin. They preached righteousness, holiness, new man. The only thing they said about sin was take it off, cast it off, put it down, get rid of it. It's man that comes in and makes church all about, do you smoke cigarettes or not? Well, it's unhealthy if you do and you shouldn't. But why does cigarettes have to be a conversation in church? We need to be talking about God and the Word. You get Him in you, He'll fix you with your cigarettes. He'll fix you with your addictions. He'll fix you with your problem. You get him first. You got the all-time fixer-upper. I don't care if you need a plumbing. He can do it all. Oh, man. Watch. He says, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me void. And it doesn't. He said, it shall accomplish that which I please. And I love this. He said, it shall prosper. 
in the thing whereunto I send it. And then he goes on telling you how you'll be led forth with joy and peace and so forth. But see, in these scriptures, he tells the wicked, the old man, my thoughts aren't yours and my ways aren't yours. Like the heavens and earth that far distance. But then he goes on to say, you get the word in you, my word, it's like the rain that comes down. It'll make it bring forth in bud. And if the church will ever get a hold of that revelation, that the kingdom of God, Luke 17, 21, is inside of you, and you've got as much the kingdom right now as you will when you step out of your physical body and what we call go to heaven. What you might not realize is biblically when you got saved like I did on June the 11th, 1977, heaven came to me. Heaven came in me. And I am filled with heaven and his spirit and who he is. And now... He and I journey together in this fleshly body. And it isn't going to be here forever. It's temporary, the flesh. And I have an eternal purpose in a temporary body. And my body is to glorify him. And he even goes on to say in 1 Corinthians, letting you know in 6, 19 and 20, that you don't even belong to yourself and you don't even own you. It says you've been bought with a price. And therefore, you should glorify God in both your body and your spirit. And then I'm telling you, church, you are not your own. We think it's all about us. He loves you so much. I'm telling you, he made you to walk with you, talk with you, and love you. And when we're around other people and we're doing things and activity, that's what ministry is. It's not in church. This isn't what church, this isn't what God wants. We just come here as a good old gas station. Get your windshield washed, get pumped up, get some revelation, motivated, get prayed. Hang around some people that's got faith. People that speak the same word. Uh, you know, man, it gets so good. And we go out of these doors and we got a whole week to sow seeds. We're seed sowers. And see, most churches hire a pastor and his job is to visit the sick. His job is to take care of this and take care of that. And those are the jobs of deacons, according to Scripture. Uh, I can show you all in the scriptures in Ephesians 4.11. I can show you what deacons are supposed to be doing. And the, in America, what preachers do it. And you know we've got people in this church that have been in hospital, had surgery and everything. I never even knew it. And I get a letter. I got a card from them. You are the greatest pastor in the whole world. And I'm reading the card. And I, man, they've had an operation. They got sick. I'm a great pastor. I never was there. Well, see, I knew what happened. So many of you visited and touched and ministered. They thought I was great. The problem with most churches is the people in the church aren't loved enough for the people to go touch them. And if the preacher don't, they're mad. And I don't know about you. I don't want somebody to be paid to come see me. You come see me, you come because you want to. And if you don't want to, you're welcome to stay home. And you don't have to send pastor so-and-so. I want somebody that's got faith. And I don't care if he's a pastor or not. Can you believe God? Can you pray? Can you hear God? Do you know his voice? Then you come here. Did you know that only, only four out of every ten pastors in America are professing born-again spirit-filled believers? Over half the ministry pastors in America aren't even saved and you want to know what's wrong with the church? When you ain't got preachers that won't stand up and tell you, lay hands on the sick, be bold, stand strong, don't be afraid. Watch your mouth. Get your tongue. It's like a rudder on a ship, James said. And whatever you say, that's where that ship will go. Set it on course. But now people want to walk around and act ignorant like a bunch of little baby Christians. Never read their Bible and ignorant. Talk little silly things. I hear it everywhere I go. Little silly religious things, you know. I tell you one thing, buddy, the rapture might happen today, and we're all going to disappear. And you know what? They're going to get stuck. And the people I'm listening to talk, I'm thinking to myself, if there is a rapture, you really think you're going? What makes people think they qualify themselves? Let me tell you, you better quit worrying about if there's a rapture, because let me tell you what's more sure. You want to hear something more sure? I mean, more positive? Your grave. Hello, it's once appointed there, man, to die. Your rapture's coming. So if you want to hang around and just look for a great disappearance for everybody, you go ahead and have at it. But personally, I don't care anything about all that junk. Nothing means nothing to me. Number one, can't find it in Scripture. Brother, it says we'll meet the Lord in the air. Go look it up. The word in the air, it means the breath of God in one spoke. It means when God speaks in one breath, everything's consummated. It doesn't mean that we're going to sit on clouds and float with little harps and be little fat, blind-headed, white, Angel babies 
playing music and floating. And I'm sorry, church, but that stuff's so much junk. This thing is real. Are y'all hearing me? You know why you're quiet? Because I'm talking about your little fat angel babies. And that's just not what this is. Look at you. You're getting upset. And your little fat angel baby can't do nothing for you. You better know God gave you an angel. And he's tall. He's 10 feet. Got a sword. Got a, I'm serious. Did you know that your angels, every one of you got them. Did you know that every physical move you make, they make? When you worship, did you know they worship? They literally walk with you and copy you. Read your Bible. And let me tell you something else. If they're going to do that, now you understand why most of them have their feet together and their hands behind their back, looking down at the ground. Because they're doing what they see people doing. Man, my angels are like, slow down. Take it easy. Whoa, boy. And I'm like, no. The Word says that God gives me angels as ministers of fire. Flames of fire. And I speak the word and they go. And that's the way Kathy and I talk. I release an angel in the name of Jesus. A guy go riding by me on a truck in the back holding a piano. And the back looks real dangerous. I released an, an angel to help that man in the name of Jesus. You see where I'm coming from? You know, oh, that's silly. It's amazing we call stuff silly. But I could come in here and you could ask me how I'm doing. And I could say, right, it wouldn't matter what I touch. It just breaks. You think I'm smart. I come in and say, oh, man, I'm blessed. I'm telling you I'm so successful I couldn't make a mistake if I wanted to. Yeah, that man's lost his mind. You are right. And I don't want to find it, and if you do find it, leave it alone. It'll mess you up because I have a new man, a new mind. And don't think my wife doesn't like it. I'm trying to quit. I know it's almost 1130 and y'all about to starve. But listen, my wife loves her new man, don't you, baby? Yes, you do. Because she was married to an old man. She remembers him. And she always wanted another husband. And God gave her one. Hey, he did. She's been so blessed to be with me for 45 years. My, my. Nobody even laughed. So, I'm just wanting you to see as we get ready to go. When God's talking about stuff like that, that gets beat into the church. His, your thoughts aren't his your ways aren't his. Well, that's true if you're an unrighteous rascal. But my ways are his ways. My thoughts are his thoughts. How do I know? Because I got them from him. He said, act like this, so I do. He said, think like this, so I do. Think on things that are good and pure and lovely and honest. Good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise. Think on that. But most people go, oh, my God, let's see. Did you say the economy's what? Let me think on that. And, and what did you say about global warming? That, uh, what? You mean it's going to melt and we're going to flood and die? Oh, let me think on that. And we're going to, church, get your mind on godly things and all this other stuff will quit worrying you and it'll take care of itself. Most of that stuff is a fire that'll burn out all by itself. It will. It'll burn out all by itself. I'm trying to quit and let you go home. You're driving me nuts. But just so you won't think I'm crazy, pull up Romans 4.17 and I'll, I'll close with a Romans 4.17. But in verbal, this will be on a CD if anybody listens. If you're listening to this and you wished I'd have got into the new man, I want you to read Colossians 3.10. I want you to read Ephesians 4.23, Ephesians 4.21 through 27 after that, in that order. And I want you to read Ephesians 2.15, about how Jesus abolished in his flesh the enemy. And Galatians 6.15, and I want you to go into that because it's about circumcision. And I want you to see that in circumcision, without circumcision, it doesn't mean anything. What matters, it says, is a new creature. And if you be in Christ Jesus, then you're a new creature. The word new creature means superhuman. That's why I have all them Superman t-shirts. It means superhuman. Plus, it has an S on it. That's my initial. Kind of fits, don't y'all think? And so, superhuman, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's the way I see me. Now, when I go to Duke Power and turn my brass in to go to work, they see the old long-haired sinner coming in. Hello. But I see me, the new man in Christ Jesus. And now, I used to go through that brass shack every day. Nobody ever said a word to me. Now, when I go through it, I'm praising God. I'm serious, smiling, speaking to everybody. Hey, man, it's the day the Lord made. We're going to have a good day today anyway. Woo! People are like, we're at work on a construction job, and he's happy. And I was, that's why I just, it did that to me when I got saved. And I'd laugh at everything I did. And nothing was too hard. I can do that. And we just go up there and just do it. And share the word. But buddy, I come through now. 
And I can hear them when I get to the other side. And they'll say, there's something wrong with him. You know, they better watch him. And the guy said, he said, anybody that smiles as much as that man right there does, you better keep your eyes on him. And I thought, isn't this, I'm smiling instead of it being friendly. You better watch me. See how backwards the world is? If you're happy, you must have a problem. So I'm just telling you, the kingdom of God's inside of you. Religion will steal it from you. Religion is all about having you be a slave. Christianity is all about you learning and understanding. You are a child in a family of the Most High. You're at the table eating with God. And that you're His child and He redeemed you, sanctified you, made you whole. You know, this is so awesome because He did all that as me. Not for me. Are y'all understanding the difference? In the church today, religion preaches Christ did it for us. Christianity says Christ did it as you. He became my sin. He was me on the cross and he paid my pain, my debt. And I'm going, no. And he's going, it's, I got this. And then when he gets through and they pull him into the pits of hell and the word teaches that he spoiled principalities and powers while he was down there. And then he said in Matthew 28 when he rose from the dead, all the dead saints rose with him and walked the streets. Read your Bible. Glory to God. That's who, all the, that's who was with him when he ascended up and it says he ascended up in clouds of glory. You go read clouds of glory, it means saints. And it, it ascended up with clouds. That's all them saints. When Jesus so powerful in resurrection, when he rose from the dead, all the dead saints got up with him. He released everybody that was in hell in prison. He unlocked all the gates. Go read your Bible. Read Colossians. He spoiled principalities and powers and made an open show of them in it. He, what that means, and, and, and if you go look it up in Greek, he went to hell, and Satan thinking that, like you were going to hell, but when he got there, they found out that Jesus is there illegally. You can only be taken to hell if you have committed an offense. Well, he hasn't. All he did was paid your offense. Now they're going to punish him as though he did, and they can't. Because he came through the womb of a woman without sin, and he come out of his body with his spirit without ever sinning, and there's not any legal rights in all of the universe that can hold him in hell. And so as soon as he gets there, they realize the righteousness of God, the power of God, the resurrection of God is in the center of the earth. And they thought they had killed him. They thought they had finished it. And now they're going to imprison him. And all of a sudden, he wraps a chain around Satan's neck, bams him all over the place, and he goes all over hell. I'm serious. And he bams him up. He beats him up. He destroys him. You read your Bible. Satan's not walking around all puffy. He don't look like he's been to Gold's Gym. He look like he's been to a crematory. Hello. Crematory is something between being cremated and being buried. Hello. So, are y'all hearing me? We got to wake up and understand the reality of this thing of Christianity. I still got five more minutes. Don't you get mad at me. I'm telling you, church, Satan is so scared of you. He is. And you, you just you got to wake up and know. It's knowledge. You got to understand. He knocks on my door. I open the door. He can't even see me. He doesn't know that's me. Picture it. Picture someone knocking at your door, and it's Satan. You open the door, and he's there for you. And there you are, but he's still looking for you. Where's Larry? I'm looking for Larry. How come he doesn't know me? Because the Word says, I have been made hid in Christ Jesus. He can't find me. He can't hide me. He can't find me because Christ has hidden me in himself. The only way for Satan to get me is go through my daddy. You cannot touch me without touching my daddy. You're not going to do it. Are you hearing where I'm coming from? Satan is a liar, has no power. He is a dummy. He is an idiot. He is a fool. Read your Bible. It says he has no power. And he's a roaring lion. And it said he is like as a roaring lion. Keep reading. Study a little bit of Hebrew and Greek. He's had his teeth pulled, baby. The worst thing he can do is gum you while he's growling. My wife and I are going through a difficult time with her life right now. And I'm going to tell you something. It ain't the first time we've been through stuff. And it probably won't be the last one because this is the way we live. We live by faith and not by sight. 
But regardless how things turn out in our life, we just, we, we live by faith all the way. And whenever they bury me, however, whatever, I don't care what caused it, you can put me in Hebrews chapter 11 with them guys. You can say, Pastor died. Yeah, yeah but he died in faith. I don't want to die in doubt and unbelief. If I'm going to die, that's fine. All that means is this part quit. The rest kept going. That's all it means. And the only reason I can say it like I'm saying it to you today is because of mostly the Scripture. But out of the Scripture, one day, and I ain't going to get into it deep, but one day the Lord gave me a phenomenal experience when I was getting ready to go to church. And I was putting my socks on, and immediately I was at a big door. And I went through the door, the door opened up, and I went in. It was the most beautiful I've ever seen in my life. White sand, clear water. I could sit here all day describing it. It's phenomenal. And there's my daddy. He's in the water. He looks like he's about 25, 30 years old. Jet black hair, pretty white teeth. Built, and like he's wearing a bathing suit. I'm serious. And he's coming out of the water smiling. And I knew him just as I did the day he passed away. And I run to him, and I, grab, I could feel the heat in his face. And he grabbed me, he squeezed me. I was crying, and he was laughing. I said, Daddy. He said, oh, son, good to see you. I said, Daddy, I ain't believing this. And we just got into it. And he said, well, sit down, we got to talk. And I sit down on the bench with him, and we talked for hours and hours to me. It was a long, and we talked about sex, power, hello, and authority. And he was telling me these three things in ministry, what to watch out, what to watch out for. And I'll never forget it. I remember that experience and everything. He, and things he told me, I've watched come to pass and happen. And I had that. And then all of a sudden, he gets up and says, oh, okay, it's over. We got to go. I got to go that way. You got to go out that door. And I said, I don't want to go. I can't explain it. I mean, I really didn't want to go. I didn't even have a desire to go back. And I, impossible. I don't want to go back. And he says, you've got to. I can't even get back to the other side until you get out the door. Because I was arguing with him. So I turned and I walked towards the door. And I got to the door and I turned around and looked. And he was in the water about where he was when I walked in and seen him. And he stopped and turned around. He said, Larry. I know y'all think I've lost my mind. He says, Larry, would you Go through that door so I can get to the other side. I don't even know what that meant. And so I just took another step, and that door said, bam. And as soon as that door slammed, I'm sitting in that chair putting my socks on. Well, I'd been up there a long time. And I said, Kathy! <laughs> I know she remembers. She's probably, and, and she said, what? I said, did you hear anything? She said, hear what? I said, have you heard anybody talking? She said, no, who's here? I said, wow. Well, the reason I told you that, when I do funerals since then, or when I'm around people that's about to cross over, I can't explain it. I have a different revelation. I, I'm not like freaking out and, oh, God, it's the end of the world. I mean, it's sad. Don't misunderstand me. You won't find in the Bible folks pass away, they didn't love, they didn't grieve. But God told them, you don't grieve forever. You know, with Moses, he said, look, I'm going to give you 40 days, and after that, you better get up and get going. I mean, 40 days, that's a long time to grieve. But let me tell you something. Resurrection life is in us right now, and when this life is over, it's going to still be in you, and it's going to be so strong that when the return of Christ comes, I'm telling you, this old earth can't handle it. It's going to shake the grave and give up the dust. Your body's coming back. But the most important part of you, your spirit and your soul, your words, what you can see in here, the part of you that has the relationship with God, that's eternal. And it's with Him right now. And when you're out of your body, you'll be with Him if you're born again. Are y'all all right today? Okay, it's been different because we didn't do the like-ass kingdoms. Next week, I'm probably going to get into the pearl of great price. I think you're going to love that. Because you're going to find out who it really was that sold all that he had and what he bought and why he did it. And in the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God has a difference. Do you know what the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is? Simple. Whose it is, where it is. Amen? All right, let's stand up on our feet. Praise God. Father, I thank you so much for the power of your word today. And I just give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for every spoken word that has come out of the mouths of believers to praise you. And in that first service when we were worshiping you, Lord, and 
you gave that inspired word about the word worship. It comes from the word worth. It literally means, what is God worth? And I thank you, sir, here. You're worth every hand that is raised. You're worth every shout that is given and every expression that is offered. Because you and you alone, sir, paid our sin debt. Touched our minds and cleansed them and made us whole. Give us hope for our lost ones and our families, friends, and the people that we love and care about. Thank you for the power of your word. I thank you that even all the saints in heaven right now are worshiping with us. In heaven and in the earth. And I give you the praise and the glory and the honor. But I speak your word over this people today, Father, because I believe in the power of words. I don't take them lightly. And I decree that the life of God permeate over every person sitting in this building. And I curse every assignment of the enemy that is assigned against you, that's assigned against the will of God for your life. I rebuke it now and I curse it. And I release words to fill the atmosphere and the air in here. To pull down the words that have been spoken against you. Because the words of God being spoken through a believer in authority are greater than words of doubt and unbelief. You have the power to pull down doubt and unbelief. Words that have been spoken against you. You have the power to curse it and pull it down. And you have the power to bless those that curse you. Because you have the revelation knowledge to understand how it works. Your mind's renewed so you know that when your emotions explode, to let your spirit be the charge, not your soul. Because if your soul and your flesh is in charge, your spirit will always lose. Remember, your spirit is the head of the house. Your soul is the mama. And your body is the baby. And if you let the baby and the mama run the house, I'm telling you, you can't pay your bills and you'll lose your home. So men, that doesn't mean just in gender. I'm talking about women that are filled with the Spirit of God. Men of God, that's all of you. Take your rightful place and say what God said. Think what God thinks. And then God says, my ways are your ways and your ways are my ways. My thoughts are yours and now yours have become mine because we're thinking and saying the same thing. Jesus said, if I'm in you and the Father's in you and the Word is in you, he said, we three are one. The Father, Jesus, and the Word. They're one. The Word. The Word. Thank you, sir, for your grace and your love today. May it shine on every face, every person they meet. May the life of God reflect from their face and hands into the life. Father, we're going to meet people hurting this week. I thank you that the life of God will flow out of these people. That they will encourage and embrace. Touch, hug, and that they will pray for those that are hurting and encourage one another. Let us all see that we have a ministry, Father. That the church is not about pastors and evangelists and teachers. It's about the sons and the daughters of the Most High doing the Word of God and His will in the earth. And I thank you for giving this people a great divine authority to accomplish all that you've called us to do. And we love you and we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, and before you leave, I'd like for everybody to say a simple prayer with me. If you've never said this prayer before, just, just say it. I'm not tricking you. And after the prayer, I'll tell you why I ask you to say it with me. But even if you're a pastor visiting, I want you to say it out loud. Everybody out loud, say this with me. Say, oh God, oh God I, ask you now, I ask you now, come into my heart, come into my heart. cleanse my life, cleanse. Touch, my touch my mind and my lips, and my lips. Forgive, me forgive me of sin. And from this day forward, this day I'll, forward. Never I'll never be the same. I receive Christ, I receive right, Christ now, right now by faith. In Jesus, name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now listen. If you said that and there's something inside of you saying, I really, really wish I could have meant that. I mean, that's what I want. Let me say this to you. You did say it. And if you could just turn 
to yourself and say, you really meant it, then you need to turn to somebody and just say, I meant that. Why? Because the Word teaches us that when we confess Him before others, that He confesses us before the angels. And when we confess Him, it shows you're not, you know, you're not ashamed of anything you believe. You're not. When you got faith and you're in something, you're not ashamed of it. I prayed for people in public and they're ashamed. A lady with a serious migraine. She said, my head's killing me. I can't move. I said, let me pray for you. She said, not here. She said, there's people watching. I thought, are you kidding? If I had a migraine, I'd want all these people to come over and help get rid of it. Hello, people watching. And you got to learn. That's what I want. You watch. Let me show you how to pray. Pow. Amen. Listen, if you'll do it, you'll be surprised how much God will show up in other people's lives. I went by a fellow's house and prayed for him a couple of weeks, three weeks ago. He had a bad back, couldn't hardly do anything. He doesn't go to church here. But I just prayed for him, missed him, loved him, left. I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything happen. I just left. Next thing I know, uh, he's gone. Went to play pickleball somewhere, and his wife's telling him he can't play. He better not. And then he left there and came over here. And he comes in with his paddle, and he not only played, he beat the fire out of me. And then he start, I told him, I said, I ain't praying for you no more. I said, I want my prayer back. He said, you ain't getting it. Boy, he was playing good, too. But here's my point. I didn't even do that. You see what I'm saying? All I did was visit a man, deliver a word, a smile, lay hands and pray, and all I, I left. Guess who did all the rest of it? You better know he did. And he showed up in that man's life, graced him, and touched him. I'm so thankful that I'm not the old typical Baptist that I could have been that would have just went over there and said, I heard you doing terrible, and I brought you an apple, and I hope you get better and leave. It's kind and sweet, but you know, I really did go in there and say, I rebuke and curse this in Jesus' name. I command your back healed, and I pray God bless you abundantly. And that's all I said. And God did it. And I give him all the praise, the glory, and the honor because there ain't a man or a woman can do anything like that. And my daddy, he did it. Somebody say yeah. Ha! All right. God bless you. I love you. Turn to somebody. Tell them you meant that prayer. You can go home. Amen. God bless you. Go do the word. Amen.